Hello there, you're watching World News on All24 News, live from Algiers. Next are today's top stories. Following martyrdom seeking operation of a Palestinian fighter, media sources reported another shooting operation in occupied Al Quds, which left at least two Zionists injured a day after a previous operation against the regime's crimes, leaving eight Zionists dead. Also in our news, Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni holds talks with the head of the Libyan National Unity Government, Abdel Hamid Beba, to discuss issues related to migration and energy files. Also coming up, Mali's Minister for Foreign Affairs stresses the need to accelerate the implementation of the Algiers Peace and Reconciliation Agreement as the best option for stabilizing the country. And a day after a public release of video showing horrific police beating of Tyre Nicholas, Memphis Police Department is permanently deactivating the unit some of the involved officers belong to. And finally, you'll be watching in our news, the Malagasy selection of local players qualify for the semi-finals of the Shan 2022 African Nations Football Championship. Hello again and welcome to the program. First in our topical news, two Zionist settlers on Saturday were wounded in a gunshot operation in East Al-Quds. The shooting occurred near the city of David settlement in Selwan neighborhood of the old city of Al-Quds. The two settlers were transferred to a hospital in occupied Al-Quds after the operation while the Zionist forces arrested 42 Palestinians. And in the same context, according to Zionist media, eight settlers were killed in a shooting attack in the settlement of Nabi Yaqub, which is established on the lands of the Palestinian citizens in the town of Beit Hanina, north of the occupied city of Al-Quds. The occupation forces closed street number one in the city of Al-Quds, strengthened their presence in the area, and shot a young man, claiming that he had carried out the shooting. Two operations by the Palestinian resistance on the Zionist occupation were able to shake Netanyahu's government. Escalation has been intense on Palestinians during the last days after the military raids that the occupation forces carried out in the West Bank. The last operation of the Palestinians, or the Palestinian resistance I'm saying, were a sign that the Zionist entity is suffering the consequences of its terror against the Palestinian people. Usama Ayadi with the report. The escalation of clashes between Palestinian resistance and the Zionist forces is growing day after day in the occupied Palestinian lands since the wake of the New Year. Zionist forces heightened their military raids, mainly in the West Bank, which is known for being the basis of resistance members. The latest retaliatory operations against the deadly Zionist raid in Jenin camp resulted in wounding two Zionists in a shooting attack in occupied East Al-Quds a day after eight people were killed in an attack near a synagogue in the city. Today we confirm that every action has a reaction and that the resistance is able to find the right response for the crimes of the occupation. Palestinian people showed their support for the resistance, which is taking the fight to a different stage. Palestinians stated that the reaction was clear and legitimate for the sake of saving their holy lands against the terrorism of the Zionist entity. Yesterday's actions were very sorrow, but the reaction of resistance made us happy and took revenge of our people in Jenin. The Palestinian presidency, for its part, stated that the security cooperation with the Zionist entity came to a halt and further called the factions for an urgent meeting so as to analyze the security situation. The presidency also underlined the need for joint efforts against any possible escalation. Netanyahu government is playing its last and desperate cards against the Palestinian resistance, which showed notable progress in its operations. It is also trying to cover up for its failure with its own people who take to the street to show refusal of its policies in every possible occasion. As for the resistance, the role is clear. Crimes and violations only generate a right to self-defense. The Zionist government is suffering the consequences of their terror against the whole population, and this kind of policies will receive the appropriate response at the right time from the resistant Palestinian people. 
The proceedings of the 17th Conference of the Union of Councils of Member Countries of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation begins on Sunday in Algiers against the backdrop of challenges and threats facing the Muslim world. In addition to the serious Zionist escalation against the Palestinian people and their sacred symbols, the participants in the name of the Islamic countries condemned the aggression of the Zionist occupation on Palestinians. They called for intensified efforts to strengthen their support for the Palestinian cause and people. Our propositions in the points of this field were for the development of parliaments and the exchange of experiences of the Islamic Arab parliaments and there are other platforms that will take place with the Arab Islamic parliaments. The community should use all its possible forces, whether economic, diplomatic, or geographical, or the general resources, or joint relations so as to achieve the rights of the Palestinian people, which cannot be modified. To a different story now, the first session of the Algerian Mauritanian Joint Security Commission was held in Waqshat, the capital of the country that is, with several issues on the agenda to be examined. In particular, the intensification of security coordination between the two countries in order to deal with the common challenges. Algeria's approach to foreign investment is closely linked to the nature of Algeria's bilateral partnerships with Euro-Mediterranean neighbors. Italy is a main partner due to its commitment to a sustainable and fair win-win economic partnership. Sarah Fergeni in this report. Algeria and Italy aim for a strategic partnership with economy at core and the purpose of strengthening bilateral cooperation in all sectors and exploring new prospects for the future. Maloney's visit to Algeria confirms the will to build an economic bridge in the Mediterranean area with solid foundations, notably including energy, trade and investment in key sectors. First, food industry. In 2022, Italy was ranked third among agricultural producers in Europe, holding nearly 17% market share on the continent. The country is also one of the leaders in the production of agricultural equipment. The sale of tractors recorded an increase of 58% in the first quarter of 2021 alone. Algeria aims to produce most of its domestic agri-food consumption and is opening up the field to investment and co-production at the local level, including the machinery and tool segment. Italy appears today as the best partner to help operate an agricultural revolution launched by Algeria. The merger would therefore be natural, given the convergence of interests and the compatibility of economic models. Many Italian companies could partner in Algeria to produce crops that are not currently grown locally or introduce methods to increase crop yields regarding agricultural machinery and the equipment necessary to process products for the consumer market. Again, there are numerous opportunities for joint ventures. But what's important is to focus on added value it's not enough to increase production or the variety of products. Attention has to be focused on how to process and propose these to foreign and domestic markets. This creates value and, importantly, employment and economic growth. The second aspect includes technology transfer, as Algiers and Rome are willing to strengthen cooperation in this field to revolutionize Algerian industry. The Italian industry machinery represents 18% of all international trade. 5,000 Italian companies specialize in advanced technology for the creation of mechanical instruments and machine components, generating 80 billion euros worldwide. Sectors such as automotive and manufacturing in Algeria will inevitably benefit from the contribution of experience and technology transfer by partnering with Italian companies. Opportunities for collaboration exist in areas as diverse as the space economy, the defence sector and the automobile industry. Other areas include the energy, chemicals and pharmaceutical industries. Important is the fact that the low energy prices in Algeria are very interesting to industries that consume massive amounts of electricity or gas. So it makes very good sense for them to take this and Algeria's well-educated young population into consideration. Regarding the energy aspect, Italy aims to become a distribution hub for Europe, both in gas and electricity, thanks to its partnership with Algeria, thus securing and strengthening a win-win partnership of excellence to avoid the economic consequences of the Ukrainian conflict on Europe.
Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni headed on Saturday to Libya, where she held talks with the head of the Libyan National Unity Government, Abdel Hamid Beba. The latter said that he had discussed with Italian Giorgia Meloni about issues related to migration and energy files, indicating the desire of the two countries to upgrade bilateral programs for the benefit of both parties, pointing to Rome's seriousness in supporting the political process in Libya. Today we discussed a number of new measures related to illegal immigration and the development of cooperation in the field of energy. We feel satisfied with the ability of the two sides to develop them and executive programs that benefit the Libyan and Italian peoples. The Italian Prime Minister also hailed the commitment shown by the National Unity Government to go towards parliamentary and presidential elections and expressed hope to turn this commitment in the form of concrete programs and actions as part of United Nations plans while respecting Libyan sovereignty. We appreciate the commitment shown by the National Unity Government to go towards parliamentary and presidential elections as soon as possible, and we hope to translate this commitment quickly in the form of concrete programs and actions within the framework of United Nations plans while respecting Libyan sovereignty. To a different story now, according to Eric Goldstein, Deputy Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, Middle East and North Africa Division, the recent decision of the European Parliament on the state of media freedom and human rights in Morocco came to confirm that the situation has reached an intolerable extent in the kingdom. Goldstein emphasized during his intervention during the National Commission for Supporting Prisoners and Conscience or Prisoners of Conscience and Victims of Violation of Freedom of Expression in Morocco that the European decision came after 25 years of silence by the letter on the human rights situation in Morocco in the wake of the bribery scandal that Morocco provided to employees of the institution. A number of UN Security Council members emphasized the impossibility of maintaining the current state of the MINUSMA peacekeeping mission in Mali. The Council was considering Secretary General Antonio Guterres' report for the first time, which put forward two options. Either it could increase its personnel to at least 2,000, or it completely withdraws and switches to a political mission if the mission's main objections or objectives were not involved or resolved, sorry. I spoke also about the activities of the mission. We're facing uh, some constraints. We're operating in a difficult environment, but we're staying the course, doing our level best to protect civilians. But clearly, we need additional resources. Uh, we need stronger cooperation with the Malians. Uh, we need um, uh, to see improvements in terms of freedom of movement uh, to enable us uh, to carry uh, our mandated a mandated task. I'm grateful to the members of the Council for their support to the mission. We have, uh, I think in the weeks and months ahead, uh, you know, we'll be working hard within the mission, but also with our Malian partners uh, to see um, how best we could improve uh, the situation and meet the benchmarks, the objectives that have been set by the mission and that the Malians themselves have set for themselves. At the meeting of the Security Council to discuss the situation in Mali, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Mali, Abdoulaye Dupe, stressed the need to accelerate the implementation of the Algiers Peace and Reconciliation Agreement as the best option for stabilizing the country. For his part, the head of the United Nations peacekeeping mission in Mali, Minusma, said that the United Nations was focusing its work on reflecting the Algiers Agreement. Regarding the peace and reconciliation agreement emanated from the Algerian process, which has been the subject of a great debate in this council, I wish to solemnly reaffirm the Malian government's commitment here to unequivocally continue with the rigorous implementation of this agreement, because we remain convicted that this is absolutely paramount for lasting stability in our country. World Food Programme warned on Friday that hunger rates in Syria have soared to record highs after more than a decade of devastating conflict. 
The UN agency said that a brutal war that triggered years of economic crisis and damaged vital infrastructure has put 2.9 million at risk of sliding into hunger, while another 12 million do not know where their next meal is coming from. And in a similar note, in Lebanon, malnutrition and the level of health care is degrading in a massive way that the state is close to bankruptcy after decades of corruption and mismanagement. Aid agencies suggest that 750,000 children are at risk and the number is likely to increase in the coming months because of the economic collapse. And in other topical news, two Indian Air Force fighter jets crashed in the central state of Madhya Pradesh on Saturday in an apparent mid-air collision. Officials said the two planes, Sukhoi 30 and Mirage 2000 fighter jets, were on routine operational or operational training missions. One of the three pilots involved was reportedly killed and one was injured and another pilot suffered fatal injuries. Authorities have ordered an investigation to determine what caused the accident. The Iranian Foreign Minister on Friday condemned the deadly armed attack on Azerbaijan's embassy in Tehran, saying the two countries should not let their ties be affected by the incident. In a phone call with his Azerbaijani counterpart, Hossein Amir Abdullahian also proposed close cooperation between the two countries' security bodies to investigate the attack that killed an embassy employee and injured two others. We condemn the attack at the entrance of the embassy of our brotherly neighbor, the Republic of Azerbaijan. Baku and Tehran should not let their ties be affected by the attack. Russia accused Ukrainian military of purposely attacking a hospital in Russian-held area of eastern Ukraine, killing 14 people and wounding 24 patients and medical staff. More details with Sofia Kenturi. Russia claimed that the Ukrainian military deliberately attacked a hospital in an area of eastern Ukraine that was under control on Saturday, committing a war crime that left 14 people dead, 24 patients and medical personnel injured. According to a statement from the Russian Defense Ministry, the alleged strike was launched from a U.S. HIMARS rocket launch system and struck a hospital in the Russian-controlled settlement of Novider. A deliberate missile strike against a known functioning civilian medical facility is without doubt a serious war crime by the Kyiv regime. All those involved in the planning and execution of this crime would be found and held accountable. From his side, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said on Friday that the situation at the front remained extremely acute, particularly in the eastern Donetsk region where Russia is stepping up an offensive. The situation on the front line and pointedly in the Donetsk region near Bakhmut and Volodar continues to remain extremely acute. The occupiers are not just storming our positions, they are deliberately and methodically destroying these towns and villages around them with artillery, airstrikes and missiles. With the escalation tensions in many areas of Ukraine in recent weeks, French President Emmanuel Macron described the Russian military operation in Ukraine as an imperialist war and said that he intends to continue speaking to Russia. The challenges are to reduce tensions in the whole region, to allow peace, respect and stability to remain throughout the continent and to enable the great challenges of the moment to be tackled together. Many nations are aiming to reduce the current tensions in Ukraine. Meanwhile, U.S. and Germany agreed to share advanced tanks with Ukraine along with Bradley and Marder vehicles promised earlier, a decision that led to criticism not only from Kremlin but from the Prime Minister of NATO and the European Union member Hungary. Tens of thousands of public school teachers and staff marched in the Portuguese capital Lisbon on Saturday to demand higher wages and better working conditions, putting further pressure on the Portuguese government. Since early December, teachers and other staff across the country have been on strike, closing many schools and leaving students unable to attend classes. The United States is bracing for a nationwide protest following a video released by Memphis Police Department which spreads online and shows a 29-year-old black man, Tyre Nicholas, being hit to death by police officers. The young man died later inflicted by injuries. More details with Islam Sid in this report. 
Protests broke out in Memphis following a graphic video release showing a young black man, Tyree Nichols, being beaten violently by five police officers. The man died three days later from injuries after being hospitalized. The officers, who were all black, had been dismissed from duty following the encounter, and they were charged with a second-degree murder and other felonies. Protests have also broken out in New York City, demanding justice for Tyree Nichols. Clashes and arrests took place during the demonstrations, which will possibly be expanded to many other cities across the country. We are here for Tyree, and we are going to stay in the streets for as long as it takes. For Tyree to see justice, for his family to see justice, but for all the victims of this racist police brutality. Nicole's mother cried as she described what happened to her son, saying that he had called out for her. She also asked for peaceful protests. For a mother to know that their child was calling them in their need and I wasn't there for him. Do you, do you know how I feel right now? Because I wasn't there for my son. President Joe Biden joined the family in calling for peaceful protests in Memphis and said he'll make a case to Congress to pass the George Floyd Act. I spoke with Tyree's mother and uh, expressed my condolences and told her that I was going to be making the case to the Congress to pass the George Floyd Act. We should get this under control. I was really pleased that she called for no peaceful protest, no no violence, no movement at all. A public outcry against systematic racism in the American criminal justice system was sparked by Nichols' killing. This was the most recent high-profile case of police officers being accused of using excessive force in the deaths of black people and other minorities in recent years. To Latin America now, in the midst of ongoing anti-president Dina Boluarte protests that have claimed dozens of lives, Peru's Congress has rejected her request to move elections up to December 20th. Last month, lawmakers decided to move the election from April 2026 to April 2024. Congress, however, rejected the proposal in a plenary meeting on Saturday morning with 45 votes in favor, 65 votes against and two abstentions. They won't let us go ahead with our peaceful march, in which demand that Mrs. Tina Bulwarty resigns, and also that there has to be a new board in the Congress of the Republic. We also demand early elections. The Haitian government is under mounting pressure and violent protest by police who accuse entering Prime Minister Ariel Henry of inaction. The UN is considering sending troops to stabilize the nation in crisis. The details with Salman Nassib. An apparent calm came back to Haitian streets after a police officer led a march against gang violence in the country. The capital city of Port-au-Prince woke up with educational institutions and court buildings shut down, although locals started to resume their daily routine. A spate of police murders by gangs spurred a protest by officers who on Thursday attacked the residence of Prime Minister Ariel Henry and later stormed the main airport. The UN proposed three months ago to send international support to the Caribbean nation. This message is for the international community. Stop with the hypocrisy towards Haitian people. We have arrived at a very disastrous moment. Haiti is arriving at a very critical moment. If the UN wants to help us, let them help us, because the country needs military aid, aid to accompany the armed forces and police officers that we have. We'd like them to be more professional in their work to allow the country to progress. To fight criminal gangs after it was requested by Haiti's government, although diplomats said discussion appear to be stuck on which country would take the lead. Meanwhile, according to the regional director of children's agency UNICEF, many children are deprived from school and their lives are under constant threat because of the insecurity the country is going through. More than one million Haitian children remain out of school, and a similar number are under constant threat of violence in Port-au-Prince because of chronic lawlessness. Asian authorities are pleading for calm and promise better protection for cops. The Prime Minister acknowledged that the police deserve protection and his embattled government has its work cut out. 
starting with meeting disgruntled police officers' demands for the equipment to do their jobs. He promised to take measures so that these acts are not repeated again. For more news making headlines around the world, here's the News in Brief. Former Army Chief Peru Pavel won the Czech Republic's presidential election on Saturday after a campaign featuring strong backing for NATO and the European Union and support for aid to Ukraine. Pavel, retired general running for office for the first time, was set to win more than 58% of the vote, defeating billionaire ex-premier Andrei Babi. Yeah. Devastating weather event. Massive flooding brought on by a record-breaking rainfall from Friday night to Saturday morning resulted in the deaths of three people and significant financial losses in Auckland, New Zealand. The storm's ferocity was evident in the city's hardest-hit neighborhoods. The 2023 Sundance Film Festival capped its first in-person edition since the COVID-19 outbreak. A thousand and one, a drama about a poor single mother and her son in New York City, won the grand jury prize in the U.S. dramatic competition. This year's winners were announced at an award ceremony Friday afternoon in Park City, Utah, which included an audience prize for a documentary, 20 Days in Mariupol. In a phone call with the International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach, Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky said that he expressed disappointment at the possibility of Russians and Belarusians returning to international competition as neutral athletes. The Malagasy selection of local players qualified for the semi-finals of the Shan 2022 African Nations Football Championship winning ahead of their Mozambican counterpart with a score of 3-1 to one Saturday at the Shahid Hamlawi Stadium in Constantine. In the semi-final scheduled for Tuesday, Madagascar will face Senegal. Winner Friday evening ahead of Mauritania. That's all for our program for tonight. For more, do visit our social media platforms. That's it. Thank you for watching. Till next time, take care.